We're very proud here at the Given Memorial Library and the Tufts Archives to pre present Peggy Kirkbell and John Dirge. Um, as you know, Peggy is a very famous teacher and John Durr is a, was the voice of CBS radio. And um, they have lots of fun things to talk about, so I won't take any more time. If you have questions about them or want to know more about them, I suggest you ask them as we go on. It's going to be kind of informal, and as you all know, we have refreshments out there, so at the end, help yourself. and. Take it away. There you have it. <laughs> Ladies first, and I want to tell you we're a pleasure to have Peggy Kirk Bell here today. And Peggy, you take it. <laughs> tell us who was your best partner that you had ever in your career. I'll ask you a question. <laughs> I'm not going to answer you. I asked first. <laughs> Well, All right. can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Can you hear Peggy? Yes. I'll pinch her if you can't hear her. Uh, of course, the babe. The babe. That's what I wanted to hear about. Okay. Talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> You're the one that played with her. I'm going to talk about it when you finish, but I'm going to let you talk first about it. Well, babe uh, was probably the longest hitter in golf. In fact, I played with... Uh, uh, Sam Sneed and Babe one time in a clinic, uh, an exhibition, and Babe knocks this thing out there and she said, Sam, see if you can catch that one. <laughs> <laughs> Sam hits it and when we get out there, she's about four yards in front of Sam. And she said, he said, ba Babe, wh where'd you get them balls? <laughs> said, uh, right the same place you did, Sam Wilson. They both worked for Wilson. So she said, I got them from Wilson, just like you did. And, uh, but anyway, <laughs> she hit it right with the men. And I don't think there's ever been a woman that could hit it as far as a man. Uh, probably the one girl from Scotland is very long, too. And, uh, but with the today's ball and the big-headed clubs, the ball goes farther. And uh, that's a problem that they're having because they had made, have made so many great golf courses obsolete. That's correct. And uh, so they're going to, I think they're going to do something. I heard the USGA man talk about the fact they let it get out of hand, the ball. And uh, they were talking about I said, well, you got to do something about it. And said, well, the, the manufacturers will sue us. I said, well, let them sue you. <laughs> you know, what the dickens? <laughs> Let's not let the game get to make these great golf courses obsolete. Well, Babe was quite a gal. Oh, yeah. And uh, one time she told me that her favorite partner was Peggy Kirk Bell. <laughs> and I said, well, that's, that's, that's good. You picked a good choice. But Babe was a, a misunderstood girl in a lot of ways, and Peggy would know a lot more about this than I would. But she came on our CBS radio show one time in New York. Red Barber had a thing called the Magazine of the Air, and Babe came on it. And, and um, we had the photographer there, as they had a photographer here, and, uh, that uh, took pictures, and after it was finished, Babe called over to Peggy, and some of you may remember my wife, Peggy, and said, Peggy said, come here, I want to have your picture made with me. And so Peggy was happy to have her picture made with Zaharia, so she admired her. And Zaharia says, now Peggy, if you ever run into somebody who says, you're the ugliest golfer I've ever seen, show them this picture. It's not true. <laughs> But I, I remember my last conversation with Babe, and this, is, uh, this was pretty sad. It was, I was at Augusta, and I was doing an update radio show. Every hour I'd do a five-minute show. This is before television. And I came in to do my show in the press room one time, one morning during the tournament. They said, gee, I'm glad you got here. They said, we've been waiting for you. Babe Zaharias is on the phone. This was after Babe had had her cancer operation and so forth was back in the hospital, and so I got on the phone, and I said, said hello to her, and she said, John, I want you to get out there and, 
and tell Mangrum and Demerit and Hogan and the rest of these Texas boys to get going. They're letting somebody else take the lead and we've got enough Texas people to win the Masters forever. Why don't you get out there and tell them? And I said, well, babe, I'm, t I'm doing my show and I've got about a minute and a half before I have to go on the show, but when I get back out there, I'll tell them. I said, uh, I, uh, I, I'm glad that you're rooting for them. Are you all right? And she said, no. And I said, she said, I'll see you in New York in July. <coughs> July, we were going to honor her with the, the uh, player of the half century. And she says, no, John, I will not see you in New York. I will not be in New York. She said, I just wanted to thank you for all you've done for me. She said, I'm dying and you'll never, I'll never talk to you again. And I had to go on the air in about 30 seconds. And that was the hardest broadcast I think I ever had to do, was to walk away from a crying babe Zaharias, whom I loved, telling me that she was dying. But that was the babe, right? Yeah. She had a great, great spirit. And I, I enjoyed knowing her very much. And I, I wish I had known her as well as you did, because you played so many, you all won what, the title holders? Well, I won it. You won the title holder. <laughs> she, she told me that she helped you win the title holder. Did no, she kick your ball in the rope? No, no. No, uh, oh, okay. That was another I, time. I played in the international four ball with Peg. Oh, yes. And, uh, in Miami? She, no, it was in Hollywood, Florida. And she said uh, she won the first seven tournaments in Florida. And now we're going to Hollywood, and I'm her partner. <laughs> And I'm very nervous about this. And she said, what's wrong with you? you? I said, babe, you won the first seven terms. You lose this one will be my fault. And I, she said, Peggy, I can beat any two of them without you. <laughs> she said, I'll, I'll let you know if I need you. <laughs> but she was, she was great. And, uh, interesting uh, person in that uh, uh, she came when my daughter Bonnie was born and she said uh, I was going to have a boy and name him Kirk and uh, in those days you didn't know whether you were having a boy or a girl but I was sure I'd have a boy and she comes and, and she says well you're going to name her after me aren't you and I said Mildred <laughs> She said, no, Babe Bell, that'll look great in print. <laughs> and that's all she worried about was the press. And the press either loved her or hated her. And they really, most of them, just she was great copy. And uh, uh, it's like uh, Louise Suggs could be leading a tournament, and uh, Babe was teeing off in front of her, and she'd say, Come on, folks, I'll show you how to play. She'd take the whole gallery and leave Suggs with nobody. <laughs> but, uh, you know, she'd, uh, she could hit the ball <coughs> over trees that none of us could do. And she was really, uh, that was her, her uh, now, you know, she had more yak-yak to the gallery. And people loved Did she like to talk to the gallery? Oh, did she? Do? She says, I'll show you boys how to hit this thing. <laughs> but anyway, she was, uh, she was a great person. And uh, she used to, I used to fly my own airplane on the tour. And she'd say, George, she says, I'm going with Peggy in the plane. I'll see you there tomorrow. Because George couldn't get in my car even, he was so big. <laughs> she said, when I married George, he looked like a Greek god. Now he looks like a T.D. Greek. <laughs> but she loved George. Oh, yeah, she was very fond of George. And, and he was a handsome guy when he was young. And I used to tell him, I said, George, you know, he had these big cauliflower ears. And I said, George, you know, you can get those fixed. They can take a, he said, fixed? You don't know how many pounds I got on that mat to get them. Because, <laughs> you know, they, it's all, and Babe made him quit boxing, I mean wrestling. And she said, it's no sport at all. It's all a show. And uh, so he quit. 
and he just got fatter and fatter. And fatter. <laughs> <laughs> he, he did get fat. Very. Of course, he was a good wrestler. He was one of seven brothers who the the uh, Zaharias brothers were the wrestling people. But Babe got well from her cancer and came back and played, and she played in the Serban Open in Miami Beach uh, some years after, a couple of years after she had first got the cancer. And it was, there was no broadcast, but I was there in Miami doing my, broad, my radio show. And so I was out to the tournament, and uh, Babe wins. And the, there was no broadcast, no, pe no cameras, no, nothing around, but Babe had put on a good show and won the tournament. And they asked me to, to interview her and to uh, make the presentation on the putting green. We had probably 200, maybe 300 people there, but it was not a big crowd. It was a local tournament, and the Serban Company had sponsored it, and they had good players, but not a big crowd. So Babe wins it, and I said, Babe, I, uh, I do my radio show from coast to coast at 10.30 on su every Sunday night, and I need, I'd need i like to have you as a guest to be on the show. We, in these, those days, CBS didn't let us tape anything. You had to do everything live. And uh, Babe says, well, I don't know about that. Says, you know, I, 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 may, I may go home. She was living in Tampa at that time. So she said, but let me think about it. About that time, somebody came out of the pro shop and said, babe, you're wanted on the phone. She said, who is it? And they said, it's George. She said, oh, God, I've got to go take this. She said, John, you talk to him until I get back. So I talked to the crowd that we had until she got back. And she started yelling at me from that back window over there about that far away. And she said, John, I can't go on the show. I can't go on the show. Can't do it. I've got to go right to Tampa. Can't do it. I said, well, I'm sorry, babe, that's too bad you've got to go. And he says, yes, he says, good old George said, he knew I was going to win again. And he called me to tell me he had a prize for me. And I want to get there before it goes down. It's a little off color, and I apologize. <laughs> but Babe was that way. It, I, actually, one time she, after she won the British Amateur, she won the Amateur Championship after she got her amateur status back and went over there and won. And it was quite an exciting win that she had. They, they, she said she loosened her girdle and let it fly. So <laughs> she, she won it. Well, she was going to be on our radio show that night, and. Mr. Barber, Red Barber said, check, be sure George knows that she's going to be on the show. And I said, okay. So I talked with George that morning. She was coming by boat, and it was coming in around noon. And I told George, I said, you know, I, as soon as she gets there, I want you to let me know. Well, I didn't hear anything from George. And when Red Barber came in from doing the Dodger game, he said, is Harris coming tonight? And I said, well, George said so. But he says, have you not talked to her? And I said, no. He said, well, you better call her to make sure she's coming. So I called down to the hotel, and I knew their number. Babe answered the phone, and I said, Red was a little concerned that you might have forgotten the show. I said, I just wanted to make sure you were here. i sorry to bother you down there. Didn't want to interrupt you and bother you. She said, oh, hell no, we haven't started yet. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's all I'm going to say about Babe. You talk about somebody else. Talk, talk to somebody else. No, but... Uh uh, I remember Babe coming in the, the first time I met her. Uh, I was walking in the locker room and I didn't know her, but I'd gone down. They said, Babe Zaharis is down on the, and I knew her as Babe Dietrichson and, and the great athlete that she was and won all the Olympic, it's like she won four Olympic medals. And uh, so I went down to see her and then I came back up and I was going in the locker room and she was sitting there and she said, hey kid, and I looked and she said, I'll play you some rummy, gin rummy. And I said, well, I don't know how to play. She said, well, I'll teach you. <laughs> and so I sat down and played gin rummy with her 
and I'd never played that three games and all that. I just played plain seven card rum. And she wins, and I mean, she she's adds it all up, these three scores, and she said, you owe me $13.50. <laughs> well, you know, I didn't know I'm playing for money, <laughs> and I didn't uh, know the game too well at all. And, uh, and the, the amazing thing, she said, well, look, kid, I'll give you a chance to get it back. I thought, I'm not that dumb. I said, no, I have to go. <laughs> so I kidded her about it later on. She said, I never did that. I would never do anything like that. <laughs> she was a great liar. <laughs> she, she never knew the truth. In fact, George said after Babe uh, died, he found out that she was five years older than she ever said she was. <laughs> it's just a joke, but that's what, she, that's what George said. Tell me, uh, Peggy, did, did she have George go with her to the tournaments and smoke his cigar? Oh, he is. And, she, she, and she, she would send him up to the hole ahead, and if he stood on the right-hand side, that meant the pen was on the right, because she could see the cigar smoke, and she would know which side of the green to go to. I don't know. Is that right? I now, you, did you do that, too? No. <laughs> Who knows what Babe would have done? <laughs> but Babe didn't uh, have to cheat to win. She was that great. She could hit it farther than anybody and and uh, entertained the get the crowds and really enjoyed the game. And uh, I don't know. People enjoyed seeing her play too because that she was the first really long distance woman yeah. hitter, wasn't she? Yeah. Yeah. And also an excellent putter. Right. Great. All right, we have some ladies here today. I, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you a story about another lady that was was an amateur, and uh, but used to come to Pinehurst a lot. And some of you who've been around may remember her being when she would come down here. She uh, would, would come. <laughs> I'm not here. You're done. <laughs> uh, Estelle Lawson Page. Do any ever remember Estelle? Some of you do. Well, Estelle lived in Chapel Hill. Her father was uh, Dr. Lawson was the first medical officer for the University of North Carolina, and Estelle lived in Chapel Hill and was a good friend of mine when I was in Greensboro and so forth. And Estelle told this this story on herself, so I. <laughs> She was playing in the Southern, Southern Amateur one time in Memphis, and she was playing against a, a girl named Marion Miley, who eventually laid a very good golfer. Eventually, she was, shot. her father was a, a pro, and somebody robbed their pro shop one night and killed her. Remember that? Yeah. But she was playing against Miley in the final, and, the, and she won her semifinal round. The next day, she was going to play Miley, who was a very good player. And she knew that there was one hole at this course that bothered her. The fourth hole required a good drive and a four iron to an elevated green. It was an island green that was well elevated. And Babe, and uh, uh, she had, not, had, had trouble with that hole all week through. So Estelle said to her caddy when they finished play that night, she said, I want you out. She says, we play at 8.30 in the morning, but I want you out here at 7.30 because I'm going to play that four iron until I get it down to where I can hit it and make it stop on that plateau that it has to hit. He <coughs> said, I want you here at 7.30. Well, that's a little early for the caddy to be there, but he was there at 7.30, and they unpacked the bag, and she went through her clubs, and she got the four iron out, and she played the four iron and practiced the four iron and practiced the four iron and practiced the four iron, and comes time to play, and she and Marion start off, and they par the first mm -hmm. hole, and the, second hole and the third hole, and they come to the fourth hole. Marion has a good drive, Estelle has a good drive. <clears throat> Estelle hit it first, and she hit a nice one up, elevated with the four iron up to the green. They saw it come up on the green. Not yet, no. <laughs> and uh, Marion hit a, a ball, it went the same angle, same way. 
And the little crowd that she had, Estelle said there may be out 100, 150 people walking with them. And they all walked up to, to the green. And they got up on the green and there's one ball. So they look over and it's Mrs. Miley, Miss Miley's ball. So the big caddy, the six foot caddy that had got up at eight, 7.30 to work practice out with Estelle, looked down and said, that's us down there, Miss Mage. Says, for all the good it done us, we might as well have stayed in bed this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Not your turn. About who? I don't know who you want to talk about. Bobby Jones. Yeah, you played with Jones a lot. No, I never played with Jones, but I knew him. And, uh, well, I played with Jones. Well, then you talk about Jones. <laughs> I knew Mr. Jones very well. I, I met Mr. Jones at Augusta when I uh, had gone to cover the football game at Duke and Duke and Georgia Tech in 1934. And I sat with O.B. Keeler, who was Mr. Jones's Boswell, Boswell, who wrote the stories about him. And I was a very young reporter for the guest on your paper. And they had placed a Georgia writer and a Carolina writer, Georgia writer, and that's the way Ted Mann did his press room at the time. <laughs> So I had O.B. Keeler as my self-mate the, in the press room. And he said, do you play golf? And I said, I like to play. My father built me a two-hole course because I couldn't play in a, any other sport either. And he said, we have a little tournament down in Georgia. You ought to come down. I said, we had a great time there last April. And I said, where's that? And he said, it's at Augusta. Would you like to come down? I said, yeah, but there's no chance I can come down because I didn't think I'd have a chance. So he said, well, you ought to come. So he talked me into it, and I had a chance. A man invited, and Gaston invited me. They were going down on Friday, and I would drive down with them and pay $2 and get me a ticket to the Masters. That's what they cost at that time. <laughs> so we go inside, and the first man I see is O.B. Keeler. And he said, oh, have you seen Mr. Jones? And I said, no, sir, I just got here. He said, well, you've got to meet Bobby Jones. So he takes me over and introduces me to Mr. Jones. And Jones says, have you met Grantland Rice? And I said, no, Mr. Jones, I just got you. Well, you've got to meet Grantland Rice. Then he wanted me to meet somebody from the New York Times, and it, it was around. So that's where I met Mr. Jones that day. And I had a, a very long relationship, friendship with him. And uh, spent many time, much, much time talking with him, one thing and another. But when Grantland Rice died in New York, some years later, many years later, Bobby Jones was one of the honorary pallbearers for the funeral. And they had uh, uh, Eddie R. Carroll, and Bill Tilden, and, uh, Hank Greenberg, and Jack Dempsey. Every major sports fan, sports hero in America, and some like Bill Tilden from overseas and others, they had, were there as honorary pallbearers and they were to go down the aisle but to the, on the funeral for Grantland Rice. And it was at a big church on Fifth Avenue. And Mr. Jones called me from Atlanta and he said, uh, they've asked me to be an honorary pallbearer and I, in honor of Grantland, I want to come to the funeral. But he said, John, I, I can never walk down that aisle by myself. Will you go with me and let me hold on to your right arm? So I said I, it would be my thrill to have my, at least my arm would be caddying for Jones then if I couldn't <laughs> caddy for my arm. So when Mr. Jones came up on the train and called me and we arranged to meet, and I met him at the church. And we got in line as the funeral director had put people in line of how they wanted. So instead of two by two, which was the way the, the stars had gone down, it was two by three when you came to Jones because he was still holding on to my arm. Well, the New York Times the next day spoke of this wonderful funeral for Grantland Rice and, and how many people were there and the, what the, the ministers had said. Then they gave a list of all the palm, palm bearers and it came to Bobby Jones and it said, Bob Jones from Atlanta and an unknown friend. <laughs> I won claim to fame, and I was an unknown friend. <laughs> but Bob, Bob enjoyed that, that we had the, the opportunity there. And then a few years later, or the next year, I guess, 
he, uh, the golf, he had given a picture to a golf house that President Eisenhower had painted for him at Augusta, painted of him at Augusta. And it was quite a lot about this picture. And, and so they were going to present it at golf house. And Mr. Jones was to come up for the presentation. And he called me and he said, I need that arm again. <laughs> so I sat in the back of the room. And when it came time, I, I walked him up to the unveiled the statue and so forth. And, this time, they didn't even identify me as an unknown friend. <laughs> but Mr. Jones, was, he was a, a wonderful, wonderful fellow. I had an awful lot of talks with him. I was talking, sitting with him in the room looking out on the course. I had finished my broadcast when, when Jack Nicklaus had his last tournament there. And it was, Jones said to me, but it has been quoted many times, and I have heard so many people use the quote, but it was said, first time at, at, at me at that point, that Nicholas was signing his card and Jones said to me, he plays a game with which I am not familiar. <laughs> and that was a pretty good, <laughs> a pretty good explanation of the way that, that Nicholas was playing at that time. But uh, I had a, had a chance to play with him one time and had a chance to collect $4 for him one time. Baby, you should have played him because he I paid off. Now he doesn't know, he wasn't like you. He paid off. He paid me four one dollar bill. I had a call. I, this was during the war. And Bob had come back. He, you know, after, he was in the service, but he came back early because he had been in an automobile wreck and he had this illness. And he, uh, uh, I had a call from Johnny Buller, whom some of you remember, and used to be in Greensboro. And Johnny said, "You, you want to play golf out at East Lake today?" And I said, "Yeah, I'd love to play golf. I'm home on furlough from India." And man, to play golf like at a course like East Lake, and I've been playing on Banny Souls in India, well, that would be great. So I said, I'd love to. What time are we playing? He told me, and I said, who are we playing with? He said, I've got some people. Well, it turned out that the people he had was a man named Charlie White, an amateur, and Mr. Jones. And so we were playing with Jones, but he didn't dare tell me, thought I'd get scared and run away. <laughs> But well, we came out to play, and so Bulla and I played Mr. Jones and Mr. White. Mr. White was a pretty good player. He shot an 80, a 71, and uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Jones that day shot a 70, which is two under par. And later his son told me that was the last day he broke par at East Lake. I don't know that that's true, but that's what young Bob told me one time. But uh, we went out to play, and I had my most satisfying day and my most embarrassing day in life that day. On the fourth hole, I, it was in October, and I had hit a ball into the trees, and I went balls with golf balls during the war were scarce to get. Remember how hard to get them, Peggy? Yeah. Very. So I, I uh, started looking for the ball, and I look over and I see caddies doing this way for leaves, you know how you hunt for the leaves. And I look, and here is Bobby Jones <laughs> down the bush and leaves looking for my ball. That's the most embarrassing it's <laughs> When we finished the round and came in, and ad they added up in the locker room, after a certain amount of Johnny Walker red label, which was generously passed around, Mr. Jones had a pleasure for that too, and uh, looked at the card, and it turned out that Mr. Jones had had 70, Mr. White had had 71, I had had 84, but Johnny Bull had had 66, which meant we beat them as a team now. You know, you're out playing team. <laughs> So Mr. Jones reached in his pocket and peeled off one, two, three, four dollar bills from the Jones, and I spent all of it for beer. <laughs> My turn? Yeah. Yes. Well, I watched Bob Jones play his last round at Augusta, and he said, if I ever shoot more than, if I ever can't break 80, I'll never play again. And he did, he, he did break it, but he never played. He never anymore. played the tournament anymore after that. No. You remember what he shot that day? He had a pretty high score, wasn't it? I don't remember, yeah. but I remember I was about, there wasn't anybody in the gallery. I was there because I knew Bob Jones was famous. And, well, he played, he played four times in Augusta, and the best score he ever had was a 73. But really? He, yeah. 
And but he that's why he decided he was he was not going to play. Anymore. Now he played golf after that. He played in Pinehurst after that, but he did not did not compete in any tournaments. There was a at that time Bob was one of those strange people. He was listed as a non-amateur. You know, he was never a pro, but he was a non-amateur, and he did not feel comfortable playing in anything as an amateur. And he was not a professional, so he couldn't take money. So he was in a never-never land. But that, in those days, and it, it, the USGA was rather strict about this. And although he was the, the star of the USGA, they, uh, they, they did not, would not accept him because he had accepted money for a film that was made in California describing his swing. And um, he not, uh, did not accept money as a golfer, but as a film. And it's always dangerous to talk about films, Peggy. You've talked a lot about films. About who? Well, he wasn't here. Films? Yeah. You mean TV? Motion, motion picture films. Oh. You, you've made lessons, of given lessons in oh, film. Okay. Uh, interesting thing was that uh, the Babe and uh, I played, uh, did I tell you this? That I played with her one time with Sneed. Yeah. And uh, did I tell you that? And she hit the ball farther than Sneed. Well, she could have hit it twice. <laughs> no. Tell it again. Well, I can tell it again. But anyway, uh, 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 Bob Jones was, the, because he took, he, he wasn't a pro, and Babe was turned pro in Texas because she had taken a Chrysler car. Yeah. And. Uh, the lady that she was playing against was the best player other than Babe in Texas. And she said, Babe, if you beat me, I'll turn you pro. And she said, you can't do that to me. And so anyway, she beat her and she turned Babe pro. And then Babe had a real long, loose backswing and hit it a mile. But she didn't know where it was going. <laughs> so, but her golf swing in as a great pl player uh, later on as, as a pro was uh, just a full swing. It, it stopped right at the shoulders and she picked up her left heel, which they, in teaching today, they said, don't pick up your left heel. And the first thing she did was slap that left heel oh. down and whack that ball and it would go. But. Uh, you want to talk? Huh? That was Mrs. Frank Goldthwaite who turned her in. You remember that? Go Goldth Mrs. Goldthwaite was a good yeah. player in Texas. Yeah. And she said, if you if you win this prize, I'm going to turn you in. And that was why she forced the thing. We had an experience. There's a lot of good amateurs that don't want to be pros, but are, for one reason or another, are classified in that never never land. I think uh, Howard uh, Howard it was. Uh, uh, Ward did that for a long time. He was a, you know, he had to finally turn pro on account of the USG did not consider him an amateur anymore. Well, I've had no problem. I, once I was going to run some tournaments in Jamaica for a golf course that Robert Trent Jones had built down there and he had the Minister of Tourism in on the speech and he said we had a, we had a man who had won the Cal California Amateur Championship was going to be our tournament director for this Jamaica tournament said, but he, he had to turn it down because it would affect his amateur status. And uh, Joe Dye was sitting with us, Trent Jones and I at this dinner talking with this man. And Trent had told him that I would be the one, the good one to run their tournament. And so this Mr. Mr. Pinto, who was the commissioner of, of uh, tourism for Jamaica said, well, yes, but how about Mr. Durr's amateur status. And Joe Dye, most of you know who Joe Dye was, the, the Lord and Master of the USGA, and in front of all these people, and God and whoever else was in the room, Joe Dye said, oh, it won't affect him. He's not good enough to be an amateur. <laughs> Your time. About what? <laughs> about I, about eleven fifteen. It's eleven fifteen now? No, it's 
11, 12. I haven't got any questions. We'll have some questions for Peggy. Who has a question? Here's one. Can you just talk a little about the beginnings of the LPGA tour and what you think of it now and its future? It blows my mind now. <laughs> I cannot imagine. We started out and there were about 12 pros. And in order to have a tournament, we had 45 amateurs. And every, every pro had to play with an amateur. And uh, you didn't play with two, you just won. And the rest of the amateurs played with amateurs. And I said, can you imagine, today they have a, a pro tour and you can't get in it because you gotta be awfully good. And then they have a, another pro tour and it, it's just unbelievable the growth of, of women's golf and what it's uh, happened to it. And it's, uh, I, I said to them, it's, they, you know, I just can't imagine them. When we'd finish a tournament, then Spalding would send me to a private club to give a clinic, play nine holes with their club champion. I can't imagine any girl on tour doing that today. <laughs> <laughs> they, they make so much money. It's unbelievable. Well, Peggy, do you know why, how the, I want your opinion about how the Asiatic girls have come up so strong. And you know, today in the LPGA, you look at the, at the list and you sometimes have to go down to sixth or seventh place to see an American. Right. And you, you know, they, they're all Kim, 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 and Kim's cousin. <laughs> well, you know what? Over there, in order for these people to have a good home and the, their kids can play good golf, that raises the living quality of their home back home. Oh. So the parents are over there pushing their kids and, and they are told, you, now the, you learn over there that women do not speak to a man unless they're asking questions. So you're out there playing a pro-am with this guy that's paying uh, you know, maybe three hundred or a hundred thousand dollars, and this girl didn't talk to him. So that hurts the game. So they they told. Well, I think that's a good rule. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, you well, what, well the, you say that if they play golf, that sort of raises them up. Yes. Their living quarters. Living, living, living quarters are better. Yeah, well, who pays their expenses? Do their parents have enough money, or is there an organization that pays their expenses? Somebody or? over there pays it to get them in. If they're good enough over there, they send to get them, them over, over here. here. And then they, but they don't want to speak. And I have gone in the ladies' locker room, and there will be two big tables. And they're all the yakking some foreign language. And uh, they take all this food and they take it out and give it to their caddies and they give it to their parents. And, and that's the way it is. They do? Yeah, they do. And I, just a year ago, I went to the, the open and I saw all this and I thought, look at them going out with this food stacked up like that. And they well, just, maybe they had a dog or something. <laughs> I'm taking to. But anyway, uh, they, they, they told me at this last tournament I went to out in Arkansas was it, where, where was it I went? Arizona. Arizona. Thanks, Bonnie. That's my daughter, Bonnie. <laughs> and uh, she went too. They paid her. Well. <laughs> and, uh, Bonnie's a good player too. I'll just have you know that. Well, she is. My husband. <laughs> No, we're not, no, Here's a question for you. Can you name those 12 women that were their first pros? Pretty much. Okay. It was Babe, Patty Bird, uh, Betty Jameson, Louise Suggs. Um, Helen Detweiler. Yeah, Helen was on. She died young, had cancer. Well, I couldn't help that. You couldn't help that? No. Uh, now, where am I? Well, that's Louise close. Suggs. That's close enough. <laughs> so Louise Suggs. Was, was Suggs there? Yeah. Was Suggs was one. She was an yeah. original. Suggs was a little girl. I, 
I probably should know this, but I've been working with Children's Hall for a couple of years now, and I thought the families supported the effort when those children come here and can be good enough to play. Am I wrong? Is it something that is subsidized another way? It's not the families? I mean, they've got the mom equipment and ability. I didn't hear the first part of I your didn't question. Hear any of children's golf. <laughs> the what? The, the golf that comes here. The, the children's the golf. Children's yeah. golf. Yeah. I think most of the families pay that, pay the way on that. That's, I, that, that, I that's not. Now, not. some countries do have, uh, do have the, the, for instance, Sweden. Annika Sorenstam, I believe, had a, a school. Uh, I mean, the, the country paid her training, did they? Annika. Annika. Annika? Uh, well, I she, can't help it. She I'm, came over here to school in some place in Texas or Arizona to college. And uh, a friend from here, a friend of mine, knew her and sent her to the North-South. And she called and said, there's this girl that's really good, Annika Sorenstein and said she can really play and she wants to play in the north-south but uh, can you get her a place to stay i said well my hotel is full but she can stay at my house and i'll take care of her so she comes to the house and she could hardly speak she was so shy and she gave me a uh, i said annika what did i call her Heineken. Heineken. That be. I'd never heard the word Annika. And I, I called her Heineken. And I said, here's a key to my house. Here's a room you're going to sleep in. Here's a car you can drive. You're, I won't see much of you because I'm busy. And uh, anyway, uh, she played in it, and she lost her second match. She left, and that was the last. And then we've been great friends ever since. But, uh, she married a boy whose mother worked in our pro shop. And uh, what's his name? McGee. McGee. Her father. Uh, McGee. He. His father's a pro too. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. You, you gave her her home then for the first time that she was in Pioneers, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got credit for that. <laughs> well, I'll yeah. mark that down on your slot then. You got credit for that. But you actually did it, you know. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, all right. <laughs> Any other questions? Questions? Can you talk a little bit about flying an airplane back in those days, from Turner to Turner and stuff? Well, yeah, that's, that was fun. Uh, I was playing in uh, uh, New Orleans and I was playing badly and I'm playing with a girl, an amateur, because we played with amateurs. And uh, so I'm talking to her and I said, I just hate that. I've just gotten a new Cadillac convertible. We got them cheap. The Cadillac was wonderful to the tour players and they still are to the men too. And, uh, so anyway, uh, she said, well, you know, if I was a tour player, I'd have an airplane and I'd fly the tour. I said, yeah, but I don't know how to fly. And she said, well, you buy an airplane. I'll teach you to fly and, and we'll fly to California. She was from California. She wanted to ride out to California. <laughs> Gloria Armstrong was her name and she became a pro later, but anyway, so we get in a plane and we go to Atlanta. She said, there's a place in Atlanta that sells them. And I said, I'll take that one. The Bonanza with a tail like this and a low wing. She said, no, no, you can't learn to fly in that. <laughs> and I said, why can't you? It's an airplane. And she said, well, it's too fast. You got to learn in this. And she points to this Cessna uh, 170 with a high wing. And it was OK, but it wasn't pretty. Like, I like the looks of a car. <laughs> and she said, well, look, you, you uh, uh, 
we take, so she says, well, she does, she's, they said it was $18,000 for the plane. She said, well, she doesn't need this or this or this or this or this or, or this. And it was loaded with instruments. And when she got through, the plane was $8,000. <laughs> and she said, and I, she said, well, she doesn't need that radio. And I thought, no, I, don't, I could take a portable and listen to the radio. I didn't know you needed it to get up and down or, or weather or anything. So anyway, so we got it all. So I called my dad and I said, uh, uh, Dad put uh, $5,000 in my checking account. And he said, what for? And I said, I just bought an airplane. <laughs> well, you don't know how to fly. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, but I'm going to learn. He said, okay, well, be careful. <laughs> and my dad was a great guy because he, uh, uh, he, really won the first auto race in Ohio. And it came in second. And there were only two in it. <laughs> anyway, so he came in second. And uh, my Uncle Harry was telling me, he said, I sat on that fence. Come on, Bob, you can beat him, you can beat him. But he said he was second. And, uh, but he, the first car that he got came in two big boxes and they had to put it together put the oh car my together God. and uh, uh, when they got it together he looked at George his, his friend he said George shall we go he says well if you go and I'll go it they got in it and in order to stop it there were no brakes you had to put your foot down <laughs> to stop the car <coughs> And uh, so Dad said, I gotta get something better than this. We'll put a break, put something to stop it with. But anyway, uh, what was I talking about? <laughs> Brakes on the car. Yeah. But anyway, oh, the airplane, yeah. So we take off with this new airplane, and she hands me the charts. She said, now your job is going to be to look for a place to land in case the motor quits. I said, the motor could quit. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm looking for a spot to land. Well, you're going over mountains. We're going all the way from California to, anyway, I mean, from New Orleans Texas, to California. No, to Atlanta. California. And now we're, so we finally, I decided she's not teaching me how to fly, and we're flying, and I'm checking for a spot to land. <laughs> and so every morning, if I had a tee off time in the morning, I'd take a lesson in the afternoon. If I had a tee on time, time in the afternoon, I'd take a le flying lesson in the morning at the airport. She wasn't giving it to me. She's playing in the tournament. <laughs> So anyway, that's, that's how I got started, and, and uh, I had a, uh, oh, I flew for years, I flew the coast back and forth, and, and I loved flying, and uh, one day I flew up to Ohio to uh, uh, see my dad, and I'd fly up, and, you know, it'd take me about four hours to fly up there, and it'd take about 12 to drive it. and. Uh, so I flew up there, and I said, give me a clear weekend, I'm going up. And I'm coming back, and they said I was clear, and I'm landing in Charleston, and uh, I could see this storm out there on the right, west of, of uh, Charleston. When I landed, I said, and this was interesting because in those days, they got all their information about the weather from the airline, they tell them what they tell them what was out there and here, and I said, well, I said there's a storm west of here, and the guy at Charleston, there's no storm there. I landed in Charleston, and I always went to the tower, and they said uh, uh, there's no storm out there, and I said, well, there is. I just saw it. 
about a few minutes along comes the Eastern Airlines says, there's a storm out here over <laughs> And I looked at the guy and he said, well, Peggy, you can beat that. I said, look, you go east of here, straight east, and go round it, and then south. So I said, okay. So I go, and I take off, and I go east. And Were you east. flying alone at that time? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I was alone. <laughs> well, I was even flying for a long year, seven years or so. And so <laughs> I kept going northeast, northeast, and pretty soon the storm socked in under me, around me, and I'm right on the railroad tracks, looking straight <laughs> down. And, uh, you, and I, so I prayed to the Lord, I said, Lord, get me down, because I was sure that if I hit a, a, my plane would hit the wires on a telephone, you know, a cable thing, <laughs> that my plane would crash, I'd get killed, and Bullet would marry some blonde. And <laughs> Raise my kids. <laughs> I wanted to raise you much. <laughs> and uh, Bonnie flew with me. You don't remember. Well, I took a nurse along, and and she looked after Bonnie. And today they have a big thing for the girls. If they have kids, they take care of their kids. It's unbelievable the difference in the way women's golf has grown. Is that enough? <laughs> Well, I got down and called Bullet, and I said, come and get me, and I said, a forced landing. He, he said, well, how's the plane? I said, well, the plane's okay. I'm down. <laughs> and he said, well, I'm going to sell it. And I prayed to the Lord, get me down, and I'll sell this plane. And uh, he said, great, because he hated it. He'd get air, air sick every time he went up. <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, he said, well, wait it out for a good day and then fly down and get rid of it. That's great. So I landed it, did that in two days. I got down there and the guy said, uh, I said, Buck, sell this airplane. And he said, how much do you want for it? And I said, $8,000. It's just what I paid for. And I knew it would sell. And, uh, and I called him up and I said, Buck, what, why can't you sell that plane? He said, you know you don't want to sell that flying machine. You like to fly. He said, yeah, but I'm selling it. And he said, he sold it the next day. And I said, every time I walk by our swimming pool, I salute it. That was my airplane. <laughs> okay, let's take one more question. Hey, how did you meet your husband? Who said that? <laughs> How did he meet you? That's more important. <coughs> uh, in the second grade. He wrote me a note. He said, do you love me or do you love Dwayne Hindle? <laughs> and I wrote back, I love you both. <laughs> anyway, the teacher got it, read it, and I ran out of the room crying. And, uh, but anyway, then... Uh, he started going with these blondes. <laughs> and I have a lot of real great blonde jokes. <laughs> and they say, why do you always tell blonde jokes? I say, I don't like those blondes. Because <laughs> uh, Bullet always dated blondes till he finally dated me. <laughs> questions? For John? No, I've had my questions. Um, I as we start to break up, you know, we have refreshments out here, and if you guys have a couple more minutes, you can talk to them, but let's kind of call the formal part over now, okay? Let's do it.